I'm Sam Legasic. And I'm Dreadful Dan Gallagher. And we're two old buddies that have lived our life at the edge of the mainstream. So come join us where things are a little odd. This is the... This earth of yours will be reduced to a burned out cinder. episode of oddcast movies music gaming it's all it's all here under one roof dan how you doing oh my god that's so much stuff i'm really good thanks <laughs> great i let's can't crack believe on it. straight into it <laughs> let's get right into the gaming side of it we're going to be talking about hellblade send you a sacrifice dan have you ever heard of this, about this game before yeah i heard about it yesterday when he told me to review it. <laughs> <laughs> perfect here's a little bit of send you a sacrifice people would like the show to actually <laughs> be like just get through it get through it um cool uh that was send you a sacrifice hellblade um so this was originally released for the playstation um ps4 and then uh it's now on xbox um and other platforms as well um but it's by a company called ninja theory yeah you know, i've always had a bit of a soft spot for because um back when i first got my ps3 they did a game called heavenly uh what was it heavenly sword um they're english as well which is which is always nice um yeah heavenly sword was ps3 one of the i don't think it was launch it was around the launch of the ps3 but it was the first time when i looked at a game and was like wow that looks fucking great probably looks shit now but in my head it looks amazing and it had like um What's the Gollum actor guy? Andy Serkis. Yeah. Um, he was like in it as well, doing motion cap stuff and all that. So it felt very, you know, cool. And then they went on and did um, another game called Enslaved Odyssey to the West, which is, I played at the time, is often regarded as one of the like most overlooked games of like the previous, well, it'd be the previous, previous generation now with the PS5 um, and all that. Uh, which is great. And that's Andy Serkis as well. Um, and it reminds me a little bit of for people who don't know, um, like Horizon Zero Dawn, which is a PlayStation exclusive. Um, it's similar to that in style. But um, yeah, but again, it was a Ninja Theory thing. But all these things are like really good, but they felt very like cult. Like I don't think they hit the mainstream success that they should have. Okay. Um, the other one they did, they did the... Uh, um, the, when they rebooted Devil May Cry, I wasn't so enamoured with that, but that's probably the most popular one. Um, and it was all right. It was okay. And then they did this, Hellblade, Send You a Sacrifice. Now, part of this was that they kind of pitched this as being a, like, um, step, not quite, it's an indie game, but it's like a step up. So um, it's like, well, I think there's a term for it. It's like triple I or something. So where people talk about Triple like, A. Triple A would be for like the the Grand Theft Autos, Assassin Creed, or whatever. Ah. So that's like the big, big budget uh, games that rake in all the money, right? The tentpole kind of events. Triple I being like indie, indie, indie. Yeah, basically, <laughs> like it's an indie. I don't, I don't know if that's the correct term for it. I can't remember, but that's what I've got in my head. Um, but it's an indie game that's kind of has all the kind of triple A almost part of it in terms of like really amazing graphics. It's got like some big talent involved. 
but it's been it's like a shorter game where it's a bit more confined it's not quite triple a okay um that's how i kind of saw this as um oh i was just saying as well with enslaved as well to see to the west that was also written by alex garland um which i remember is a big uh, punning point but anyway so send you a sacrifice what is it what the what the bloody hell is it um it takes place in like like the eighth eighth century or something like that like back in bloody viking times or whatever good Um, time good time to be alive definitely it's one of the best times and basically uh it's a bit of a difficult plot and i'll try my best to describe what i thought was going on but you play senua and you are basically going into hell now whether that hell is real or not kind of depends on how you're seeing it but part of it is to do and this is one of the big things they push during the marketing and it happens at the beginning of the game is they push like the mental health aspect of it which is that she's basically like gone insane um and she's having like psychotic episodes yeah so even though um she's like trying to work her way to hell um and the reason why you find out is because like her lover like um when you find this out during the course of the game but basically she was kept under lock and key by her father who seemed to be some kind of like king or you know head of the tribe or whatever um and she was kept under lock and key as well as her mother because basically they had um psychotic issues they had mental health problems put it that way Uh um so she's that's obviously not helped um so she's she was only let out every now and then she's got daddy issues put it that way um and she met this guy and they fell in love and all this um and then this tribe came and basically strung him up um in a ritualistic fashion there's a cool scene where he's like his whole skin has been like pulled apart so it's kind of like a jesus christ pose yeah but his entire skin has just been pulled apart um and it's just like flopped out, whatever. Is he still he's alive? No, he's dead. Well, oh, okay. you, don't, you don't know. You only turn up and he's already like that. He's been dead for however long. So you know, um, if they did it to him, living or dead. That's a thing in, in Norse uh, law. I think it's called a, an angel of death. That's right. That's what I think it is. Yeah. And apparently it was, some people have refuted this and said um, it's not true. And this was part of the reason why the uh, like Norse and the Vikings got this uh, image of being t- particularly barbaric. Um, right. But basically it was said that they used to employ this technique of the angel of death um, where they would cut the person open from the back, right. um, pull their lungs through, still attached, and basically fold open all the skin and just suspend them. Ugh. So your lungs would be external to your body and everything would just be suspended hanging in air. And it's probably one of the most miserable deaths you can imagine. Yeah, it sounds obviously horrific. Um, Just a little bit of local colour there for you. Well, this is what apparently is like, or something similar at least has happened to this guy that she liked. So she's got his head and it sounds like she's trying to like save his soul, basically. She's going to go into hell and do something with the head and save his soul. So... You, I'll go through the plot and then go through like the mechanics of it. So you kind of go up against these different enemies, but they're all like a bit fucked up. They've all they've all got like masks on. You're not sure if they're real or not. Blah blah blah. Um, and then yeah, and then it's pretty cool because you you go you know, like everything gets darker and more horrible. And there's certain segments which are quite cool, which I'll get into. Um, but essentially, you've then got you find this big tree. And it's like, you need this sword to kill Hela, Hela, whatever her name is. Um, and you have to go back into the delve into these parts of your memory or brain to kind of put together the energy to get this sword. So it's kind of like gaming tropes, essentially, uh-huh. um, to a degree. You get the sword and then you go to battle Hela, whatever her name is, um, who's this like massive, huge, like giant, weird corpse like thing which is pretty horrific and pretty cool um and then basically you realize that um you know that 
you kind of come to terms with the fact that your boyfriend's dead and you kind of get on with your life. <laughs> um, and that's kind of how it basically ends. That's how I kind of understood it. But there was a lot, there's a lot kind of going on. Okay. Um, and there's some really cool bits. There's like, um, throughout the whole thing, uh, you're hearing these, so it recommends that you play it with headphones. And the reason why I didn't actually do it, did do this, I played it normally, but you have voices whispering in your head as you go along and it's mm. in like a 3D audio space. And the idea is that these are like your, this part of the curse that she has or whatever. Um, right. But, but presumably kind of, it's also emulating what psychosis feels like. Yeah, exactly. That's supposed to be part of it. And also, weirdly, they kind of work into the gameplay because if you're battling something, they'll go, behind you. And then you know to, like, block from behind because someone's attacking you, which is which I always thought was a bit weird because then it means that basically um, they're, you know, you can't see behind you. Yeah. I'm sorry, my cat's going crazy. They can't see behind you, but you've used it as a gameplay mechanic. I don't know, just all that. But then at the same time, is the question of whether or not they're real in the first place, whatever. Yeah. Um, and there's, yeah, so there's cool bits where, like, um, it kind of starts off and it's more like a physical thing and you've got this, like, big brutish kind of guys that you just have to, like, fend off. And then you kind of go and they talk about, oh, like, be careful of the uh, the trickery. They'll play tricks on you or whatever. And you, and you, it becomes a bit more puzzle-orientated hmm. where you have these, like, portals that when you look through them show a different reality, but only slightly so that for instance, there's like, you'll go up to a portal and if you look through and enter through that portal, um, you'll see like a staircase that goes up to where you need to go. That's not there. You need to go through that specific portal to find that, which will be means this staircase just comes out of nowhere and you go up there to do X, Y, Z and all that stuff. That was pretty cool. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and there's these big, like, epic landscapes of, like, beaches, like all these big Viking ships that are just, like, pulled apart and, you know, fucked up, basically, just lying around, like, in this graveyard. Um, Sounds creepy. And, yeah, it is pretty creepy. There's a real element of, of, like, horror to it. And you've got these, like, old abandoned towns. But at the same time, she's having these, like, breakdowns where it's, like, all going pitch black and she's looking at you, the camera, she's hearing these horrible voices and they've intercut it with like real life footage, but they've stylized it because I was watching it going, that's not graphics. That's like video. Oh, right. <laughs> just playing a video of someone like dressed up doing stuff. And that's quite interesting. And I was like, that's something quite cool that Ninja Theory have done there. It's quite a stylistic part, which is quite interesting. Um, and yeah, but there's certain bits in it as well. There's like, there's one bit where, um, uh, they kind of copied it from, I think it's Silent Hill Homecoming, which is Silent Hill 5, which is a bit shit, but where you're like running through corridors and there's this light trying to grab you. Um, and there was one specific bit where um, this light was trying to get me and I was stuck in this fucking maze, basically not really understanding where I'm going. I was like, in principle, this should work, but it doesn't. But not long after that, you like lose all your senses and you can only see a little bit in front of you. And you're going by sound and you can just hear these horrible, like fucking near invisible creatures around. And you're trying to make your way through this like fucking cave. Well, f at first it's like uh, like barns and all this shit. And then you fall down or something and you go into like this cave and you're going through all this cavey stuff. And it's like pure fucking tense, tense, tense horror shit. Sounds like, like anxiety shredding. Massively, yeah. Massively anxiety inducing. And that bit was really cool. Um, and then, yeah, then you can, you go near the end and it gets a bit more like combat heavy. Um, and yeah, it's quite cool. And there's all this use of like this big, like hell basically being this like big bloody massive bodies and death. And they're all trying to reach out and grab you and shit like that. Huh. Um, which is quite cool. And like one of the bosses is this like big, weird fucking like massive dog beast like thing that's trying to kill you and all that stuff. So it's quite, it's got quite a cool little few set pieces and it's only about, I think it took me about 10 hours to complete, maybe 10 to 12, maybe. So it felt like a much shorter game, like much more easy, easily digestible than, than other ones. Um, and yeah, so I guess I should kind of talk about 
the the gameplay a bit. Um, yeah, especially this is, uh, auditory hallucination thing. So gameplay wise, um, for the most part, it's kind of half combat, half puzzle. So the combat's pretty cool. A lot of people seem to have a problem with this, but I actually quite enjoyed it. Um, so you've basically got a sword. <laughs> Um, you have like a kind of heavy attack, light attack, you have a dodge, and then you have a counter, which is basically um, if you obviously press the counter at the right moment, you'll kind of knock them off guard and you can smash them up a bit. A um, parry, so, if you will. Parry, yes, that's right, yeah. So that's exactly what I was doing throughout the whole thing. Um, I just timed it to an absolute fucking T where I was just constantly yeah. getting all these yeah, parries in. And then you can basically use... That's like a slow mo thing if you need to. Um, so if you're kind of struggling or whatever, if you're up against a mighty foe, then you can kind of slow stuff down and then you can kind of smash around. And then later on, you get enemies who that doesn't affect them or anything like that. Um, there's only a real handful of enemies. You get like kind of the more normal ones who just come at you with their swords. You get ones that have like clubs and shields, which are a bit more um, tricky to sort out. Then you've got like massive brutes who have these like big hammer things that you can't kind of stay away from. Um, so, and that's kind of it, basically. You have like a kind of selection of ones that are similar um, to that. Um, and then, so that's kind of one side you're going through. And usually there's these big skirmishes or whatever where you might have to take on like, so they appear out of nowhere as well, like a puff of smoke, literally. Mm. Um, so like towards the end, you start finding yourself, you having to take on about like 15 or something of these guys before you can carry on. Um, so that's one side. And then the other side, you've got puzzles. So for them, you'll usually like look at a door or something and then through your mentalness or whatever, if you're with your mind, you have to see these symbols and then you have to walk around the environment to match the symbols to the environment around you. Which at first I was like, oh, that's quite cool. But once you're near the end of the game, you're just like, fuck off. <laughs> Especially when you're walking around, you're like, and you're like, I don't know, like, I can't match it up. I don't know what the fuck I'm supposed to be looking at. And then, yeah, you've got like the portals and all this stuff and you have to go through. And it's like, oh my God, just please just let me find it so I can just open this fucking door. It's like um, if you're trapped in the crystal maze after the first few <laughs> rooms, it's quite good fun. But if you're in there for 10 hours. Yeah, you get a bit sick of it. And also like, I don't really like the idea of like, here's a door that you need to open, go and do this massive thing, this really annoying thing, and then you can open this door. It's like, just let me through the door. Continue the <laughs> flow. Stop causing obstructions to like fill out the fucking runtime of the game. Um, I imagine it's a difficult thing to get the right balance in that aspect. Yeah, exactly. And it's also kind of like, yeah, true. And it's also weird because then it's like, Let's talk about using like the mental health thing, like seriously. And, you know, I was going to use this for Nerd's Corner, but whatever, but like they went to like a proper, um, they went to like Cambridge or something, um, university and spoke to like a a psychologist there to make sure they could get it all right and treat it with the right respect and all this stuff. And then you're like, yeah, but you're using it as like a gameplay mechanic, which feels a bit weird. Like, I don't know. It's strange. Anyway, and you go along and there's like, you can see these runes, runes, I should say R-U-N-E-S, um, which if you unlock them all, apparently you get a special different type of ending, which I didn't see. I think it must be marginal. Um, and they give you little backstories. And they're filling you in on like basically the, the kind of Norse or whatever it is, mythology, the history of it all. But to be honest, I was just like so bored of it and it didn't really make that much sense. And the story I had to really like, I was like, I'm not really sure what's going on, but it's enough to kind of keep me mm-hmm. pushing on. Okay. Um, if that made sense. That's uh, a shame because <laughs> to me, that's one of the more interesting bits about this game. Yeah. I feel like they, they did their research, but um, they clearly did it, but they just did it. They're just, it's old gaming tropes, which I'm just like, haven't we got past this now? Like, so. If you like, all right, for instance, like you see a rune, you press the button and then it's someone telling you about like, it's it's a fucking mythological story or whatever. The problem is, is that to hear it all, like when I first did it, I pressed it. I was like, okay. And then I started walking off and then it got quieter and quieter. And I was like, okay, so I have to stand next to it. So I'm literally just standing there listening to this guy talk for like a minute, which might not seem much, but when you're just wanting to carry on. Yeah. 
and you're like, I'm listening to stuff that's kind of gobbledygook as well because I'm just yeah. waiting for it to finish. It's uh, like uh, I'm it's having the same problem. I'm I'm playing Wonder Boy in Monster World on Sega Mega Drive. <laughs> Is that what happens? <laughs> you're just constantly talking to people. You're trying <laughs> to sell it, you. Not even, but even if it's talk, even if there's some like agency to it, but it's not. You're just like it's. I always think of things like Dead Space. I don't know why I use that. Or like Bioshock, where you listen to these like little radio, um, little voice recordings, um, which are fine. I always think, okay, right, if they're short enough, it's okay. But at least with them, like you could walk around and carry on doing what you're doing whilst listening to it. You know, just fucking stand by it to like digest it all and you're not even listening to it anyway. So there's that. Um, your graphics wise, wise is great. It looks really nice. They do have a gameplay mechanic, which is interesting, which is every time you die, you get like a black mark. It's like an oil kind of thing uh-huh. on your, it starts off on your hand and it works its way up to, up your arm. And basically Ooh. they say, if it reaches your head, it's game over and you lose your save. And that's, that's it. cool. Oh, that's a really good idea. And it's very evil dead. Yeah, it's evil dead. So the thing is, I was like, okay. And I was really starting to like, I think the first time I died, I was like, fuck. Because it got up to like my wrist, like first time or whatever. Mm. It's like, fuck, what, like, what's that? It only means I can only die like fucking six times or something. If that's the case, I'm going to totally fuck this up. And then, um, as I said, like there was that bit where this light follows you around this maze. I died probably about 20 times doing that because I couldn't figure out which way I was supposed to go. And each time you saw it kind of crawl up further and further, basically when it got to like your shoulder, which is like you're wearing some clothes over it, it didn't actually reach any, it didn't go any further. So I think okay. it's actually bollocks. <laughs> oh. I don't think it's, I don't think it's an actual real mechanic or maybe I, it, it didn't matter so much, but I died a lot at that one specific place. So maybe it's, I don't know, maybe you have to die in different places or something for it to work. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, maybe they don't want to punish you too much if you're like stuck on one bit. Yeah, which is which might be the case. But um, I was really like worried when I was like, man, if I don't do this in my next go, it's going to reach my head and I'm not going to be able to do this. And I started to freak out a bit. And then uh-huh. after it, like the 10th time, I was like, okay, I just need to get this done. Just need to get this bit done. Um, That's cool though. I like that. It's like the black spot. Yeah, exactly. So it was an interesting mechanic if it is a real thing. Um, and yeah, and that's basically the entire gameplay uh, of the whole game. It's very like action heavy. It's very dramatic. Like, so there's some behind the scenes footage of like how they did the binaural sound, if you can call it that, is they put a mic up in the middle of the room that had like a 360 degree recording thing. And they had actors just kind of like whisper and walk past it and do whatever um which was interesting um and uh but yeah they they did kind of spend a lot of the time talking about how they research psychosis and what it's like but i i don't know it didn't feel right yeah if you know what i mean like i felt like it didn't really it's just a weird way to use it on like a viking girl or whatever <laughs> from the eighth century um yeah it's like can you can does like modern psychology relate to that or whatever? Like I can understand it's the case of like a woman with um, mental health problems back then would have been told to be cursed and kept in a fucking room and not let out or things like that. I kind of understand that. Um, but the whole thing just feels barbaric. <laughs> if you know what I mean? Barbaric. Yeah. It's like it, we're literally in times where people beat each other over the head with clubs and like, as you said, the angel of death or whatever and all this. It's like, yeah, I don't, it doesn't really surprise me. Um, I think this area of it kind of, yeah, it's, it concerns me a little bit. Um, I'm not sure what to think of it. There's a lot here about all the lengths they went to to try and make this authentic um, and quotes from people involved in mental health about how um, accurate it is. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of people from uh, a lot of quotes from people who actually suffer from um, psychosis. I think using it as a, like an element of gamification feels a bit, bit wrong. It's like that thing of like we're doing this to um, you know make people aware of mental health issues and, and, and uh, educate basically. It's like, yeah, but you're also selling it. Makes me think of, do you remember when the Body Worlds thing first opened? 
Yeah. And they were like, and there was a lot of um, controversy around that. And they were like, we're doing it to educate the public. It's like, not really. Most people just want to see a dead body. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People want to see real flesh and they would pick the skin taken off and see what it's like. And that's Before what this that feels morbid like. Fascination. Yeah. This feels like it's, it's, it's a morbid fascination, maybe, of people to be like, oh, what does it sound like to hear voices? You know? Well, it's weird to use it as part of the marketing. Yeah. Like, I don't know, it feels like exploitative in a weird way. Yeah, I think that's, that's what I'm kind of saying. Like, you, you can say, like, like, have a thing at the beginning, which is what they did, but, like, have a thing saying, oh, this has been, we did this in conjunction with the Royal Academy of whatever, doctors, I don't know. Fine. But don't keep banging on about how fucking holier than thou you are because you've, like, taken it seriously hmm. and then use it to, like help you in the it's like, is it a narrative thing is it a thing that you're like we've got this story and we want to take it seriously or is it like yeah cool we need something to like help drive the gaming mechanic of what we're making or something i don't know like it's a bit i don't know just something felt a bit a little bit off with me about it um but yeah. at the same time i enjoyed playing it it's like it's nice to play like a short and sweet game in that sense i didn't really know i wasn't 100 percent sure what was happening um some of the uh, plot, some of the, not the plot points, sorry, some of the like um, scenes, let's say, within the game just didn't really work, I feel. Um, and yeah, as I said, there's a few old gaming tropes there. It just felt a bit annoying. Um, but I enjoyed the combat side of it. Um, I thought that was all right. Uh, the puzzle side of it, I didn't really like so much. I liked it to begin with. It just got old fast. Yeah, um, and yeah. To be honest, even the combat, like the whole thing, that last like level, it's just waves and waves and waves of enemies. And so by that point, you're just like counter, chop, 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 move, dodge, K, okay, slow mo, right, counter, dodge, counter, counter, dodge, dodge, jump back, slice, but and all this stuff. And after a while, you're just like, it's only so long I can keep, yeah. <laughs> I can keep slogging away at this for. I quite um, like a bit of hack and slash, so I'd probably quite enjoy that. I'd find it therapeutic. Yeah, but it was more like when it was kind of like creating a mood, um, then that's when it worked best. As I said, the bit where you like can't really see anything, you're trying to go by sound and all this stuff, that was fucking cool. That was probably the best bit because it was just so fucking tense. Um, you mentioned the look of the game. It was very nice. Um, I really like the character design of this uh main character mm. I think it's really cool with this like blue band across her forehead and under her eyes apparently mm. that's authentic mm. um, I was just reading I mean you've heard of uh, Bodicea or Boudica yeah well only really through reading a little bit about this but yeah but it's, it's, a name, to be it's a name it's a name that is you know In pretty well known looks. even if you don't know what she did or anything mm. But apparently this character is based on a similar historical figure who was only discovered in 2002. All right, well, there you go. That's quite cool, isn't it? Yeah. It's quite cool. I only found out about her then. Um, so there is, yeah, that's what I was saying like earlier. I was like, oh, I'm quite interested in the historical uh, and like the, the Norse mythology part of it. That would have been quite fun, I think. Yeah, I think there's definitely something... I think... If you paid attention, you'd probably come out quite a lot. But um, I wasn't (laughs) paying as much attention as I should have. Um, But, yeah, um, generally speaking, I thought it was really cool for this studio. who have obviously done a lot of big stuff, but they were just like, we want to make this thing and we're not going to spend loads of money on it. Um, And they they did it. They had all the tools to do it and they did it. and it's been yeah. a success? It's been a success, yeah. So there's a sequel already announced called, um, it was Hellblade 2, Senua's Saga, I believe it's called. And I think it might be coming up just on the Xbox, um, but I might be mistaken, or at least to begin with anyway. Um, yeah, don't, don't know anything about it. Um, I think I saw the trailer and it's like her with some like troops. So I guess this time around it won't feel so like isolated because it was just mostly you just walking around by yourself. Um, Sounds like a normal day in my life. 
it sounds like a normal day in everyone's life at the moment. There's probably a lot of people hearing voices in their head. It's not via like Zoom. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, that's kind of it, really. I don't really have a nerd's corner. Um, I don't think we have any reviews either, do we? I'm sure we can find some. Well, have, have a look. Have a look for those reviews. Um, but yeah, just overall, I guess for like my my final thought, um, I enjoyed it, and it looks great, and it feels good. Um, I just feel like it should have been a PS3 game. <laughs> Um, huh. what do you mean, mean by that well as in it feels like it should have been more the generation before it doesn't feel like it's doing anything particularly new or innovative and as i said it kind of clings on to some old gaming tropes it doesn't feel like there's much evolution here uh, but yeah some of the character design is cool <laughs> it's got some cool parts to it um and the fact that it wasn't given like loads of marketing hype and there wasn't so much budget or pressure behind it means that um it kind of gives it a lot more uh, room to like make mistakes if you know what i mean it can have like a bit of an easier time when people are um reviewing it and playing it uh because it came in at a cheaper price point and all this stuff as well um uh, rather than being like a proper whatever uh, 40 to 50 quid game mm. um 60 dollar isn't it or, as the Americans would say. Um, well, that's just your opinion, Sam. Mm. But what about the opinion of Kevin Mendez? Let's hear his opinion after the sting. I hate it. So just having a little look on Amazon, uh, Kevin Mendez, he only gave this one star. Wow. And wrote a review under the title, Meh. My favourite word. (laughs) I thought this game was going to be awesome, but it honestly turned out to be like that bland sandwich you get from random gas stations. No variety to attacks, and the story was not intriguing. Now that is not like a sandwich. (laughs) If it's like a bland sandwich, then he should have said, just, you know, white bread, dry and boring. But his metaphor didn't stand up, did it really? No. Didn't stand up. Oh, so, yeah, I would, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Got another one here for you from Alex. One Again. star. Yeah. One star. With a, a review with the title, What the? Hellblade? So I no, that's it. It's just what the dot dot dot. No, he's, he's missed out then. Okay. The game is claimed to be new. Okay. But then why when it came, there was no plastic wrapped around the disc box as it usually is (laughs) when the game is new. For all I know, somebody could have played this particular disc, finished the game and then decided to resell it. What the fuck? Oh, heaven forbid. I mean, yeah, if you're paying full, if you're paying the full price for a new product, I can understand. (laughs) It's a valid, uh, valid review. Yeah, very practical. Um, One more, Mr. Ashton, one star. Repetitive gameplay equals boring. Yeah. Um, He says, I don't know why it says to wear earphones for the sound, as it sounds just the same on the TV. I wouldn't (laughs) recommend this to anybody, and now know why it was cheap to buy. Dear. I don't, you know, it's not that bad. It is repetitive, though. Like, as I said, like after a while, you're just like, okay, I just need to finish this. Just need to finish this now, please. Let me do it. Um, but let yeah, me, uh, I think it's worth it for the moment. Oh, sorry, has he got more? No, I was going to say, let, let me temper this with a, okay. a... Most of the reviews are good. Most of the reviews are very good. But usually most people that write a good review have a lot to say about it. Um, but Dawn simply gives it five out of five. Amazing. This is a very good game. One of the most immersive games I've played in a while. I love the combat puzzle story and the way Senua was brought to life. The Hellblade feature is a must-watch too after you have completed the game. Oh, yeah, talk about behind-the-scenes thing. I watched a bit of that and I was like, yeah, enough. (laughs) Not according to Dawn. It was a must-watch. Must-watch. Yeah, it's not a must-watch. It's interesting. (laughs) 
I wouldn't say you must watch it. Most people just talking about how stunning it looked. Uh, interesting ground, groundbreaking gameplay. But that's one of the things in Ninja Theory, and as I said, like Heavenly Sword, is that they look great. The games look great. Um, so, yeah, it does look really, really good. Uh, but, yeah, I don't know. It's hard to recommend it. Like, it's okay. It's okay. Like, if you want a short game that has a bit of that combat, then you know, go crazy is definitely a lot worse out there. But I don't know if I tell. I don't think I tell anyone to go out of their way to play it. And they, that's the damp squib we're going to end this episode on. <laughs> <laughs> Are though. you being haunted? By the way, it sounds like Ooh. I can hear. Yeah, it's because it's the problem is like living fairly close to the sea, um, and recently it's been really windy. Those bloody so, sea ghosts. Exactly. So the sea ghosts have invaded. <laughs> Those bloody they roll in off the uh off the English Channel. Exactly. Bastards. Oh, they're, they're complaining about the the fish in the sea and who they belong to now after Brexit. Yeah, um, complaining about the added VAT that we have to pay on uh, imports from Europe. Exactly. Bums. Um so that's that's it basically. It's short and sweet. Um I don't think there's much else to say about it. Uh, I'd be interested in what other people think about it. And also, like, if anyone actually died on it, if the permadeath mechanic yeah. was real or not, um, let me know, because uh, I really feel like it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, what are we doing next week? Well, it's a good point, actually, Dan. Next week, we're going to do a movie. I think we've decided we're going to um, do Tetsuo, the Iron Man. Now, this isn't Marvel's Iron Man. This is a Japanese kind of body horror from the 80s uh black and white weird uh how do i put this weird arty kind of film that is all about japan's fear of technology um but it's really fucking good and it's cool and it's got a dick that's a drill so <laughs> you enjoy it um cool all right well we will see you on the next one guys that one's definitely odd I don't think this one was that odd, so maybe we shouldn't have included it. <laughs> but next week, we'll make up for it next week uh, with Tetsuo, which is most definitely an oddball. Um, thanks, everyone, and uh, see you next time. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to Oddcast Movies, Music and Gaming. If you want to get in touch with us or get a movie, album or game put on our list to discuss, then email us at oddcastoddballs at gmail.com or a new winter podcast at gmail.com. This is part of a new winter podcast network, so head on over to a new winter.net to check out our other shows. You can also follow us on Instagram at a new winter, Twitter at a new winter, and you can head on over to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash a new winter. Thanks for listening and see you again soon.